So this yes. Welcome to the 2023 edition of Trieste Next. I'm Luca, an AI-generated speaker who will presenting our festival. In the next three days we will be talking about a new world. This is the title of the 12th edition of our Festival of Science. Innovation and Research, the Ethical Limits and New Frontiers of Science will be the center of all our events. What will the new world be like? Will we be able to face the challenges of the near future applying new scientific discoveries and technologies in a sustainable way? This will be the underlying theme of Trieste Next, with 100 events in English and Italian, the Science Book of the Year Literary Award, 300 speakers, 70 activities for schools and 40 exhibition spaces that are open for everybody in the city center close to the town hall. Before leaving the floor to our next panelists, I would like to thank all the scientific institutions within the Trieste City of Knowledge Network, the main partner together with our content partners and sponsors for supporting our project. Mostly, thank you to the 200 volunteers who are helping us. I have one last remark for all of you. The next event will last 75 minutes. Our speakers will answer all of your questions in the final 15 minutes. Also, please remember to check the updated schedule of events on our website. Thank you and enjoy our festival. Okay, great. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session on uh, Health and Work, Challenges in a Changing Economy. My name is uh, Maria Lubue, and uh, I recently joined the University of Trieste, the Department of uh, Economics, uh, Business, Mathematics, and Statistics, after spending uh, several years working uh, for the United Nations and uh, the University of Göttingen in Germany. And my research has been focused, uh, among other things, on uh, uh, children's health and uh, on uh, reproductive health, uh, mostly on developing countries and in the context of Indonesia, where I also provided some consultancies for the government in terms of uh, the provision of health facilities. Let me introduce also our speakers of today. So we have here, in alphabetical order, uh, Olivier Bagan, who is a uh, uh, professor of economics at the University of Bordeaux and a uh, member of the Institut Fran uh, Université de France. Um, his research covers topics in uh, public economics and in labor economics, and uh, he has been a former member of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors to the French uh, Prime Minister. Um, then uh, we have uh, Ludovico Carino, um, who is a, um, a researcher uh, also at the University of Trieste, and his research uh, is uh, um, investigating the links between uh, population well-being and public policies, uh, with focus on social, health, and retirement policy. And he has been also consultant for the WHO, for the OECD, among other things. Um, then we have uh, Jonathan Salus, John Salus, who is the head of the London Hub of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies based on LSE, and is a senior health economist at WHO Barcelona Office for Health uh, System Financing. Uh, his research is also on health uh, systems, focusing primarily on uh, health uh, financing policy, health economics, uh, health system performance, and uh, the economics of population aging. And um, then we have uh, Florence Rousseau, she's professor of economics at the University Paris Dauphine. Um, her research is in the field of health economics, uh, fo focusing on the measurement uh, and analysis of uh, uh, inequity in health, in healthcare use, and in health insurance, and more generally on the evaluation of health systems regulation policies. And um, she is a member of the French Strategic Advisory Board for COVID-19 vaccination. So, 
going back to our session, we uh, identified, we are going to discuss today uh, what we identified as three say, key uh, um, challenges uh, for our um, economy and for our society. Um, the first one being uh, the issue of aging. Uh, so is this a burden or is this an opportunity for public finance and productivity? Um, what we do observe, this uh, will appear more clear in the presentation, but we, we, what we do observe is that uh, the number of people uh, that are aged uh, 16 and above is rising, and according to projections of the WHO, it, uh, uh, it's going to rise even more uh, to something like 2 billion in, uh, by 2050. And um, basically, this is an issue which is relevant everywhere in the world, but especially in high-income countries. Uh, demographers and economists have this, this tool uh, to describe the things which is called age pyramid, and what we are observing basically nowadays is a pyramid that is not anymore a pyramid, it's kind of deformed, meaning uh, basically a la larger proportion of older people uh, at the top and uh, shrinking of the pyramid at the bottom due to uh, declining fertility rates and uh, longer life expectancies. So what are the implications of this? What are the implications for the elderly, but also what are the implications for the working age population? Um, and uh, what are the implications also for our uh, public finances and productivity? Uh, of course, this can be also an opportunity as long as uh, our population uh, with aging uh, is aging in a healthy way. Uh, so we are going to uh, understand this uh, a bit more. Second challenge is the theme of uh, uh, equity in health. So how to ensure health for all. Uh, health in older age, but in any age, is not random in the sense that variations in people's age are uh, reflecting on the one hand simple genetic endowments, but also they are due to um, uh, physical and social uh, environments and the influence of these environments uh, on the opportunities and health behavior of people. Uh, what that means, it means that a person who is uh, sick or, or and it's from a, a disadvantaged background is more likely to experience than uh, poor health and less likely to may might uh, be less likely to get access to uh, services and care that they need so how are systems uh, are aligned to these needs and what do we observe also more importantly uh, this will uh, uh, will be in Florence's presentation is that uh, we see uh, large inequalities in health outcomes uh, happening not only between countries, countries uh, also very different countries in terms of high income versus low income, but also within countries these things are happening. So we're going to understand uh, why and uh, what are the implications. And um, the first challenge which, that we identify is basically uh, considering what are the changes in the labor market that we are currently observing. That means, for instance, uh, smart working, uh, that means artificial intelligence. So do these cha changes are going to bring uh, opportunities or uh, uh, are going to represent a risk for health, for mental health for workers, but also for physical health? Um, and um, last, uh, keeping on. Uh, in a way, uh, the connection to aging, uh, but uh, considering uh, the, the working age population, we are going to analyze to which extent, uh, uh, say, this uh, issue of aging uh, might have some implications for the working age population in terms, for instance, of the strain on the informal care provision. So, uh, say, family members who might uh, take care of the elderly. Uh, so, how this uh, is going to uh, is, is happening today, and uh, what are in the near future. So uh, I now leave the floor to the first presentation, so for the first challenge to John Silas, who is going to talk about aging. Thank you. But nothing happens, hold on. So thank you for having me. So I'm going to open us uh, off talking about uh, population aging and this idea that the the aging of the population will have detrimental effects for the economy. Uh, does this do anything? Ah, there it goes. Okay. So, I think this first slide will not come as a surprise to anyone, 
Populations are aging everywhere. And so I wanted to show, of course, even in Italy, as we all know, Italy has one of the oldest populations in the world, uh, the, the age mix of the population is changing. So what we see here in this figure, this is data from the UN uh, that shows population projections through the end of the century, broken down by age groups. So this blue at the bottom is children, zero to 19. This purpley color in the middle is the working age population, more or less, 20 to 64. And then the orange, 65 to 84, and in pink, 85 plus. I think what we see that's interesting, and this is a common, um, a common pattern that we see across many countries in Europe, many high income countries, is not only is the population expected to shrink over the rest of the century, but the distribution is expected to change a lot. There's going to be a lot more people who are older, so the population over 85 is expected to uh, more than triple. And the working age population, the people who are most traditionally uh, involved, attached to the labor market, is expected to shrink a lot. So from around 60% in 2020 um, to, to just 47% uh, by the end of the century. And so these changes, oftentimes, uh, people look at these changes and they think that this will have bad implications for the economy. Of course, it makes sense. Having fewer working age people, fewer people involved in informal work is, is going to mean that we're, we're producing less, we're generating less. And so there's this common thought that, of course, as the population ages, the economy will decline. And so the work that we've been doing in the European Observatory and in WHO is to really challenge these narratives and say, okay, is this uh, an inevitable consequence of demographic change, of changes in the mix of society, or is there anything that we can do about it? And so I want to show you um, three pieces of work that I think are interesting that are related to this. So the first is related to the question of an older working age population. So there's, there's some research, there's some policymakers who think that an older population, an older working uh, population is less productive. So maybe people, either they retire early or they, they produce less in their job if they are still, uh, still working. What we wanted to know is whether health plays a role. If older people are in good health, um, does this moderate the effect of having more older people on the economy? So we looked at data uh, across nearly 200 countries um, since the, 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 I think from 1990 onwards, and we did some models to see how the size of the population age 50 to 55 to 69, so arguably the, the older working age population, how changes in this, uh, the size of this group affected uh, real per capita GDP growth. And then we look to see how the, 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 the health of that population at, a, at a, an aggregate level, how that might influence this relationship. Um, and so this figure, which I, uh, my, my daughter likes this figure because it looks uh, like a rainbow. Um, but I think it's a really nice summary, although it needs a lot of explanation. So um, let me see, does this have a, yeah, it has a dot, great. So, so basically, think of it like this. So the, the x-axis here, this is the size of the population, the older working age population. So more older people, fewer older people. This here, so we're, we're measuring health here as years lived with disability among people who are 55 to 69. And we take the inverse. And so what this means is that bigger values are healthier populations, right? If we're up here, it means that we have a healthy, older working age population. And down here, it means not so healthy. And what we did is we, we're predicting uh, economic growth, real per capita GDP growth. And so dark blues and greens, these are, these are sad colors. Sad colors mean slower economic growth. And as we get to these brighter colors, these would imply more economic growth. So I think the best way to show this is by placing a country here, right? So let's say we have this, this country here, according to this modeling exercise. We have a country with a large older workforce that's in poor health. The models, based on the historical data, would suggest what people expect, that having more older people is bad for the economy, that the economy will grow more slowly. However, if we take the exact, uh, the predicted values from having the exact same sized older population, but if that population is in good health, so exactly the same, you know, the, let's say, I don't know, let's say this is 18% of the population is 55 to 69, right? If we have the same size, 
but they're in relatively good health, the mo we would predict that you would have much higher economic growth. And actually, if you think about it, and you look at these figures, whoops. I like animation. Um, if you had a much smaller working age population, whether they're healthy or not, right? If you had like a, you know, a sub-Saharan African country that has very few people, um, or a developing country setting that has very few people at older working ages, actually the health status doesn't matter, right? So, so basically what this implies by this, this curvature here is that if you have a healthy population, the size of the older workforce doesn't matter, right? You end up as a country in the yellow or maybe even in this orangey red color. So the, the takeaway measure here, takeaway um, message here is that the, si the, the size of the older population matters, but if that population is healthy, then it cancels out any effects. Whoops, keep pushing the wrong direction. There we go. Okay, so this was talking about people who are in the, the labor force, the traditional formal workforce. Uh, but what about people who are older than that, who are, have no uh, attachment to the labor force or are very unlikely to have much attachment to the labor force? Um, it's very hard, of course, to empirically demonstrate that there is a, an economic argument, let's say, for um, investing in health at older ages, or even, you know, if you say, okay, well, you know, we have many people over age 65, over age 70, are these people, they're not, pro let's, they're not producing any uh, economic value in the sense of that they're not working. So does that mean that having more of them will mean that we have uh, slower economic growth? And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to challenge this idea by looking at how older people spend their time. So we use data, time use survey data, which is uh, data that people record how they spend every minute of the day uh, over a 24-hour period. And we look in these models, this is data from the, the UK, to see how health impacts the way that people use their time. Um, and so that's shown right here. So these figures, so for example here, uh, we have in green, this is people that report very good health, in red, very bad health at different age groups, so 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and 85 plus. We see here, for example, at this top one, uh, older people who are report being in good health are much more likely to engage in transport, which is things like uh, taking a walk, r driving themselves, leaving the house. Uh, they're more likely to do things around the house. Th these are very sort of vague sounding activities, but these, are, these correspond to things that people would do, right? Looking after grandchildren, looking after other older people, gardening. And so what we've done is we've taken these different activities and we've assigned uh, wages, hypothetical wages. What would be the value if someone else was doing these activities? So if you're doing your own laundry, if you weren't doing your own laundry, you have to pay somebody else to do this, right? And we do this and we sum this all up and we model what's the difference in terms, what's the value of good health at older ages? What's the difference in terms of the value of the way you spend time at older ages if you're in good health versus if you're in poor health? And these are our results. So if you're 65 to 75, 74 years old, about 645 pounds per person per month, and it, incre it increases uh, as you get older, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it because health is a very important determinant of your ability to engage in activities, right? If you're an 85-year-old and you're in very poor health versus very good health, the person who's in very good health is much more likely to be active than somebody who is in poor health. Just to put this in perspective, this, uh, God bless you, uh, this is, uh, amounts to about a quarter of real per capita GDP in, per person in the UK. So we're talking about per person in these non-monetized activities, being healthy accounts for about a quarter of the, the, the economic value of being a person. So I, th I think these are fairly compelling arguments that um, aging is not such a disaster, but that health really matters. Um, which is a tricky uh, conclusion to come to because aging, of course, also has implications for health systems, and health systems are an important determinant of whether people age in good health. So I wanted to show two slides, I'm oh, sorry, two, two images here just to give a sense of how uh, policy choices affect health systems uh, related to aging. So this is data, this is using a, using a simulator that we created called the PASH simulator, which is available online. You can Google it, P-A-S-H, and play with it. It's very fun. Um, and so this is data for Italy. 
Um, and so what this is, is basically we're, we are doing a thought experiment, which is if health systems f were financed exactly the same in the future as they are today, based on which types of taxes you used, based on how much people use health services in the country, if the only thing that would change over time was the age mix of the population, so having more older people, what would happen, right? Um, and so this is what this does. And so we, we index this to 2020, and in green, this is our revenues uh, for health, and in red, this is expenditures. And what you see, unsurprisingly, is as we have more older people in Italy, this, so this is data for Italy based on uh, Italian demographic data and Italian health revenue data, um, as you have more older people in Italy over the, the next uh, 30 years, expenditure will go up. It will go up very slowly, but it does go up due to aging. However, revenues, because they are very diverse, uh, Italy has a, an NHS-style tax finance system, uh, which has benefits and drawbacks, of course, but in terms of uh, its resilience to these age demographic changes, it's very diverse, right? There's taxes on, there's VAT, there's income taxes, there's property taxes, there's everything, right? And because of this diversity, you see that it's pretty unaffected by the aging population because even if people age out of work, there are other taxes that you're paying even if you're not working. And so what we see, even though Italy is already one of the oldest populations in the world, if you, depending on the data you look at, it's either the second oldest population or the fifth oldest population among countries with a you know, population, I think, over a million. So it's, Italy, you guys are old. It's an old population, right? You still don't see this effect, uh, much of an effect here. Revenues are fairly stable. Um, and so our estimates would be that according to aging, um, the gap between expenditures and revenues would be about 1.7% of GDP, which is not, um, not inconsequential, but um, considering the, the degree of aging is not surprising. And it's all driven by expenditures. If we look just next door, at Slovenia, Slovenia is a very different health system. So in Slovenia, rather than a tax-financed NHS, they have uh, social health insurance that's funded almost exclusively through labor market contributions. And as we talked about, the, the working age population is going to shrink, right? So you have fewer people contributing because over the rest of the next 30 years, in Slovenia, although Slovenia is relatively younger than Italy, there will be fewer people that are working. And so if you keep things exactly the same as they are, while the population is younger, so you don't see as much growth, these, these axes are slightly different, I think, um, because it, it, it's, uh, it's automatically produced in the simulator. But even though you, you have a, not as old of a population in Slovenia, um, so this grows a bit slower, the revenues decline much more because the labor market will shrink. And so in Slovenia, because it's all based on social contributions, it's all based on workers paying, you see that uh, revenues are expected to decline substantially. So in Italy, this gap at the end of uh, the period is basically 80% driven by expenditure growth, whereas in Slovenia, it's about half driven by expenditures and half bit driven by revenues. My last slide is just to wrap things up. Um, so I think the main takeaway I want to leave you with is that this idea that aging is this disaster, this uh, catastrophe, easy to say, catastrophe for societies, for economies, is it's more nuanced, right? It depends on the health status of older people. Health is an important determinant. Um, and if people are in good health, they can benefit the economy, they have less health spending. I didn't talk about this, but they would be less costly. Um, but this is not a guarantee. And to do this, we need to make smart decisions about how we design our health systems, how we allocate resources, how we finance health systems. I'll leave it there. We can talk about it much more, but um, thank you for your attention. So, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be there, and I'm very proud to be invited to discuss with, uh, with you today about also another issue related to aging. If 
not only if the population is healthy, but if everyone is healthy. Because for the World Health Organization, equity in health is also one of the main objectives of a system. And in this presentation, I will discuss about differences that exist uh, among the population between health inequalities and several explanations, poverty, behavior, and also the role of the organization of a system and financing. So, First, you know that we have huge differences, for instance, in life expectancy between countries, between Europe and Africa, for instance, but also among Europe. And among Europe, uh, we have some countries, but also some parts of countries where life expectancy is very large, more than 83 years old, and in some other is less than uh, 75. So, for instance, between a man in Italy or in uh, Hungary, the difference is close to eight years of life expectancy. If now we go within country, we observe as well huge difference. Here you have the gap in year between someone with a university degree and someone without any education. And you see that this gap could be in some countries, for example in Canada, about four years, but in the, uh, Hungary, if I take one well, notice this example, it's close to 10 years, and in Slovak Republic it's more. Okay. If we look at Italy, we see that Italy performs quite well. The, the gap is only about five years, and in my country, in France, is higher. So, but now, if we go deeper to the difference, is it only because the rich have higher life expectancy or because of poverty? Is it only a question of poverty? And if we look at that, it is a very impressive work conducted in the US, but we have done exactly the same in France, and we have the same results. We have linked that are about uh, the, the age of death with income taxes records, okay? And there was a possibility to observe a life expectancy all along the income distribution, okay? Here people are run according to the household income, so by percentile, so each point corresponds to 1% of the population, and here you have life expectancy. And what we observe is that with someone who belong to the first percentile of the population, so the poorest people, life expectancy is below 73, whereas for someone at the top of the income distribution is more than 87. So in the US, the difference among men between someone at the top and the bottom of the distribution is about 14 years. So it's larger than what we observe in average in Europe between countries. And in France, the difference is, is about 12 years between the top and the bottom of the distribution. So in fact, it's like someone was living in Sudan, whereas someone was living in Liechtenstein or something like that. So it's very impressive. And there is, it's not very, obviously, very poor people have a huge differences in life expectancy. You see, the line is straight at the beginning of the curve, but the relation is, exists all along the income distribution, which means that any additional euros or any additional dollar is associated to the longer life expectancy, which means that, in fact, the main explanation of inequalities is inequalities in income. And if a country uh, have larger income inequality, obviously, mathematically, there are inequalities in life expectancy because there are more people at the top and at the bottom of the distribution. Now, some other explanation. First, what about, uh, uh, sorry, it's not a good way, <laughs> I do the same. What about lifestyle? Here, for instance, if inequalities in overweight for, among women, okay, obese women, overweight women, and or not, the probability to be obese. And you have one more time differences for uh, at the top, poor uh, educated people, uh, the round point correspond to this probability among well-educated people. And you see that in all country, 
a poorly educated people have a higher probability to be obese, but the extent of the difference is not the same in all countries. And for instance, in uh, in United Kingdom, the difference is lower than in Italy or in France. Hmm? If we think of that. So, for example, if I consider the difference between France and the UK, perhaps overweight, differences in zone overweight is one of the explanations of the, the large extent of inequality in health. If I go to smoking, in that case, in the UK there are huge inequality in smoking, whereas in Italy and France the difference is lower. So, which means that it's not in all countries the same type of behavior that may explain uh, differences in life expectancy. In some countries, more alcohol, overweight, or smoking. And now, what about our system? We need to explain that for two reasons. First, to know if difficulties in access to health care is one explanation of differences in life expectancy. Here's a long term. Or, second issue, if people, poor people are the diseases have as difficulties as problems due to other reasons, such as poverty, hard working condition, or uh, behaviors, are they able to find treatment, medical appointment, in order to, to, be, to, to have a solution for their health problems? And then what we observe here, in that case, it's horizontal, but you have here the probability of accessing a family doctor, a general practitioner during the year among the world population and in white point. The white point corresponds to the poorest population and the dark one to the rich population. So we observe that in some countries we have huge difference. Uh, it's okay, for example, in Slovak countries or in Romania, in Poland, so in all former uh, well, Eastern countries, in fact. They have huge differences in access to a family doctor, and they have huge inequality as well. So we know that a system is one of the explanation of inequalities. If we look now at Western countries, almost everyone can go to the doctor, but there are some differences in all countries except in one in the UK. It's completely the same probability. But there is also a question of intensity. And in France, we have a huge probability to see a doctor, but we have some differences. If now I come to specialist, the story is completely different. In that case, we have huge differences in almost all countries. And the, the extent is very, very large in Italy, for instance, and if it was okay for everyone to see a doctor, a family doctor in Italy, it's not at all the case for a specialist doctor. And it is also the same in France and in the UK, one more time. The difference is smaller. So, several type of explanation. We have asked people questions about their unmet needs. So, if they are foregone, decided not to go to the doctor or to have a surgery or a treatment due to the cost. And in almost all countries, we have incredible differences of the proportion of the population we will answer yes to that question. And it is particularly large in Italy, which means that for rich people, no one say, I renounce to go to the doctor due to the cost. But among poor people, it is more than 30% of the population. If I have the, the same question about now, having decided not to go to the doctor due to waiting time, one more time, Italy is one of the countries with the largest differences among income group. And one more time, in that case, France is not so bad and UK as well. And finally, what about distance to healthcare? And in Italy, one more time, there is a huge, incredible difference according to income in the fact you are unable to go to the doctor due to the, to the distance to healthcare. So if I sum up, Italy has an incredible life expectancy. Differences according to income group are not so large in life expectancy, so it's quite good. But in fact, there is no large differences in lifetime and so on. Diet are quite good. 
but there is an incredible difficulty for some people to access in healthcare. So one issue, if you think the right, do you know, yeah, if people start to become ill, they have real difficulties. In France, we have inequalities at every step. <laughs> also for uh, access to healthcare, and now if I come back to, to the UK, for instance, there are also inequalities due to income inequalities that are huge. There are also inequalities in lifestyle, especially in smoking and overweight, but they have a very egalitarian health system. Care are completely free at delivery, but for all care, not only for family doctor, and it's also the case for going to specialists, there is not at all private hospital and so on. And then they have the ability to, to give care to everyone, whereas in France or in Italy, because we have also private sector in addition to the public one. So, so at the end, to finish, and further in my life, like, it is one more time in the US. You know that in the US, the system, the policy, and the health, police, uh, health and social policy differ a lot according to state, because in New York and California, the law is not the same than in Texas, for example. Okay? For example, to have access to free health insurance and so on. And what we observe is that life expectancy is completely, the, exactly the same in all US states for people that are below the median income, so for quite middle income people or rich people. But we have huge differences at the bottom of the distribution. So the way we organize social and health policy matter, but matter mainly for the poorest, those who have to work a lot with our working conditions and so on. So if we want to have an healthy society, an healthy active society, we have also to care about the way to provide care to everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here uh, in my own city. I invited myself. Uh, and I'm very glad that a lot of wonderful colleagues joined, uh, together with Maria, who works with me at the University of Trieste. Um, how to continue this panel? I think uh, this is really an exciting panel. We have listened to very complementary views. First, a macro perspective of the effect of aging on societies, on economics, uh, on economy per economics performance, um, and the role of health, and then uh, a more in-depth discussion of the, um, let's say, inequalities in health in the systems. Um, I think, let me start by saying, uh, yesterday at another panel someone asked me, what do you think are the most important policies for aging populations? I think that what uh, John has shown us, uh, uh, tell us that uh, uh, there are no necessarily specific policies for aging who only target older people. For example, if you have a healthier population in older age, even if people age, your economy can grow fast. But in order to have a healthy population in older age, you need to think about it 30 years before, 40 years before, 50 years before. So a lot of policies can be connected to this issue of aging. Um, let me show you a couple of examples uh, on a, a specific uh, perspective. So uh, in, in economics, uh, we can have a simple framework of, uh, let's see if, is this the pointer? Yeah. So, aging, uh, for a person who is aging, what are the dimensions that are uh, very simplified, of course, the dimension in his life or her life? So, health, so being autonomous or being frail, the level of well-being. Then another big dimension in aging is the availability of a care network, the availability of family, friends, uh, social connections. And the third dimension is income and wealth. You work or you don't work, how rich you are, how much is your, uh, your pension. Um, of course, if you are richer, you can purchase some, something in terms of care or uh, out of your pocket, so you can pay. Um, or if you have friends or if you have a family, you can have informal insurance if something happens to you in older age. Uh, on top of that, there is the government and public policies who, who intervene in the life of people. So an example of the 
potential opportunities or conflict uh, uh, between work and health, uh, stemming from public policy, as example. The work longer um, uh, mantra. Pension policies push people uh, to work longer. So we know that we have uh, in some, uh, of course, dimensions of our lives, uh, famous people who are working throughout their lives, even at very old age, above 90, uh, 80, or, or 90. Um, but if I ask you, what's the effective age of labor market exits? So at what age do people stop working? Well, this is, the, this is data from 2017. Italy is at this level here. The average age at which an Italian person stops working is 62. And this is the gradient with other countries. Uh, governments want to push people to work longer. So what they do is they tend to increase the legal age of retirement. This is legal age of retirement, OK? So legal age of retirement for men and for women in OECD countries, you can see there were years when this was very low, at 63, legal age. Now the legal age is increasing. But of course, people can decide to stop working earlier. No? Uh, and there have been a lot of reforms that have started to push people to work longer in life. Uh, now we ask. Are there, what are the consequences of these reforms? So the first consequence is people work longer. It works. So you postpone the age of retirement, the legal age of retirement, and many people adhere, many people uh, comply. Are there other uh, consequences? We argue yes. And this is what I would like to very briefly to show you in terms of intuitions. A retirement and pension policy that targets the employment decision of people can also have effects on other dimensions of this, people, of this population. For example, can affect their health. Therefore, it can be very important for the health policy of a government. But it can also affect the long-term care era, uh, area of uh, intervention. What is long-term care? Long-term care is help for people who are vulnerable with loss of autonomy. Okay, typically old people. So. Let me, let me show you with this diagram. We, uh, you have a, a, a public policy which intervenes because society is old, uh, I mean, is aging, so we want people to work longer. So we postpone the, the pension age, and this pushes people to work longer. Now, can it be that this also has an effect of the health of these people? We focus on mental health because it's very relevant uh, for older people. It's uh, one of the main sources of disability worldwide, so very relevant. What we find, effects on health. So example from the UK, but this is valid also in other countries. I'm showing the UK because I work, I'm working there, and this is where I, uh, the, the study that I've done. In the UK, the government has uh, legislated a reform, in uh, pension reform, that has postponed the age, um, the retirement age, by up to six years. Okay? Instead of retiring at 60, if you are a woman, this is only for women, you have to retire at 66, depending on where you were born, when you were born. Uh, long story short, many, many women have worked longer after the introduction of this reform, which started in 2010. So w w women work longer, but we find that the risk of clinical depression, which is a very serious and costly and long and long uh, running uh, um, problem, increased. But again, sorry, not for everyone. Not for everyone. Inequalities. So Florence's speech. It increased among women in high strain jobs. What are high strain jobs? Tough jobs, jobs that are uh, inflexible and heavy, demanding. Among them, we find an increase in the risk of depression, clinical depression, by 12 percentage points, which is huge. Uh, high strain jobs, so housekeeping, restaurant services, personal carers, salespersons, cleaners, and so on. Uh, and this is an unintended effect of the pension, uh, of the pension reform. Second effect, unintended effect, effects on long-term care. So you increase the state pension age. This has an effect on the work decision, also on health. But we ask, do people use differently the time that they have during the day because they have to work longer? Can it be that because they have to work longer, they have less time to provide care for 
older people, their parents, for example, who are vulnerable and in loss of autonomy. This is a very important issue because, you know, informal care, so family help, is the main source of help in all developed countries. And especially 30% of people older than 50 provide help to their parents or partners, but especially parents, who are uh, vulnerable. And in Italy, this is even larger, so very relevant. What we find is, let me skip this first, what we find is that working longer, for example, an average amount of hours per week, 30 hours per week, is related causally to a reduction in caregiving the same person. So she works longer, she has to reduce care, and this amounts to 30, um, 330 hours per year, which we value in, if you would have to buy it on the market, 7,200 uh, uh, pounds. Uh, again, <coughs> is this average? No. Inequalities kick in as well. Only women who work in, um, sorry, next slide, uh, only women who are engaged in tough jobs face this conflict. Women who are in higher socioeconomic status can more easily combine work and family. Um, second, if you are in a situation of sandwich generation, so you have to care for both your parents and your child or grandchild, which is also a very, very valuable source of family help in our societies, you also s show a very large drop in caregiving activities due to working longer. Um, the next question is, what happens to the older person? So the daughter works longer, and we find she provides less help. OK, you could tell me nothing changes for the older parent that they have dad or her mom. Someone else will substitute this reduction in care. We find that in the UK, this doesn't happen. Older people receive less help if their daughters work longer because of the pension reform. So this effect of the pension reform that uh, at the beginning was targeting older workers uh, around the age of 60, has a spillover effect on other generations and it reduces the help that other generations receive. And this can, of course, turn into a very big uh, social, uh, social cost. So my point is health and work from the public policy perspective. I'm a public economist, uh, so this is my main focus. Beware of tensions between work and health and care. Re pension reforms are well intended, but we need to be careful about inequalities effect uh, and effects uh, on, uh, on health. And of course, the intergenerational uh, role um, and the connections that people have in their, in their lives. Um, in Italy, we have a big discussion. How much time do I have, uh, Maria? OK. So l to conclude, why is this relevant uh, for Italy? Italy as a country which is a uh, population who is aging, uh, there have already been pension reforms who postponed the state pension age. And Italy is a country where informal care is very strong. And the role of public in long-term care is rather weak. There is a, a, a new law in Parliament right now. It, was, it, it passed as a, as a blank law in general, so-called legge delega, for a complete reform of long-term care in Italy. And now they are trying to design a new system of long-term care in Italy that can effectively also support caregivers, but also provide formal care. Because there is another point that I think we need to, and I tried, I learned from my, from my work. There are cultural norms in societies. So the fact that you provide care for your parent, for example, to what extent is this really a choice? It depends on the culture in your society. It might be that you are forced to do it. It's not a choice. You must do it. So regardless of whether you work or not, you have a tough job or not, you have a grandchild or not, you must do it. This is how the culture works. Of course, this, is, this might be beautiful, but for some people, this might be problematic. And of course, this is not random. It will always be the poorest lower educated and with a more difficult life 
who will find themselves in a tough spot. And I, I think what I learned from my own work is that public policies need to account, need to anticipate these unequal effects across uh, generations. Thank you. Bonjour à tous. Uh, thanks a lot to Maria and Ludovico for the organization of, the, of this session. I'm going to talk about uh, the future, about which we have no idea. So it's a, a difficult exercise and um, focusing more on the working age and, and work revolutions with an S uh, and uh, in relation to health and uh, public policy. So first, transformation of the labor market, then what kind of opportunities or risk we are facing in the future and the role of public policies. Work revolutions with the S, there are many, you know them, uh, the natural, but we, we cause them, like the pandemics uh, and the huge challenge of the, of the green transition. Uh, technological changes with uh, artificial intelligence, AI, and platforms like Uber and many others. And societal with the big quit, big resignation, bullshit jobs, you know, and um, post-pandemic uh, existential questioning, you know, what are we going to do with our life? Should we work like crazy as we used to do, okay? And um, economists are very bad at predicting the future, but it gets even worse because things are changing so fast and there's so much interaction between these different phenomena that it's even harder than usual to, to predict anything. So everything I'm going to say is more than tentative. The first point about work revolution, uh, there's a big fear of a massive technological unemployment. Like dozens of uh, uh, million uh, jobs um, destroyed in Europe because of uh, robots, artificial intelligence, and so on. And it's true because it's already started uh, in automatic production for uh, instead of chain workers, uh, assistant, intermediaries, and even expert jobs like tax advisor, accountants, etc. And some doctors like radiologists and so on because robots and big data can analyze data much better and be more precise than us in predicting things. And even managers. Uh, as robots uh, or uh, artificial intelligence can be more rational and op optimized better. Um, it's probably very much overstated because, as my colleague said, there's an aging population, so there's a shrinking of the working age uh, group, uh, which is also counted in millions of, of uh, jobs needed uh, at the same time, uh, and, at the, and on top of it, there's an increased demand with all the, um, the new technologies, but also basic jobs as cleaning, uh, health ads, construction, uh, a lot of things that robots can do, which is with a human touch, like uh, education and social and care, and a big need for doctors, as we, as we heard before. Uh, jobs related to the green economy, like green agriculture, and of course the uh, happy guy at the bottom there, the top IT, top engineers, these connected creative or concept jobs. So the labor market is more of a, a big reshuffling where we can have a lot of mismatch with uh, uh, unfulfilled uh, needs and at the same time a lot of people who, who uh, are out of work, including white collar and not only blue collars. Another revolution is of this is, uh, or challenge of this is the, the, the fact that uh, the, uh, the jobs are going to be very diverse in terms of status. Uh, so the rise of the gig jobs, like independent workers, like platform workers, like the guy, uh, the Uber del delivery guy, which is uh, roughly already 15%, like 28 million jobs, so 15% of the labor force in Europe. So no the, a decrease in salary work as we know it, but a lot of independent workers. Uh, for whom we need to find social protection, uh, change in work ex working style with a lot of teleworking, post-pandemic, uh, as we know, a big acceleration with some people who are fully remote, and there's a new globalization of workers because you can employ an engineer in Morocco or in uh, France or in India, uh, uh, wherever your firm is located. Even firms are not located anywhere for some of them anymore. They're also very much dispersed. 
Um, I'll skip the things related to aging because we heard them uh, already through, through the, the presentation of my colleagues. So now the opportunities. Automation will replace chain worker. It has replaced it a lot already and expose them less to hazardous job. And in that sense, for health, it's a, it's a very good thing. Um, the fact that you can be more flexible and work from home means you spend less time in traffic jams and less time at work. There's the Nobel Prize, uh, Daniel Kahneman, who has this uh, day reconstruction method where he, he kind of monitor how happy, how well being, what's the well-being of people hour by hour during the day and also including with who you spend this hour and I don't know if you know this series with Ricky Gervais but that, that's really a, a, a boss that you don't want to have because he's really an asshole and, uh, and Kahneman is recording um, how happy you are and then the, uh, the worst thing is commuting at the bottom of the scale and the time spent with your boss is also part of the things that you don't really want to do. So spending less time with these people and or spend less time in the car is a, is a good thing thing, obviously, for mental health. Uh, there's also a direct use of technology for health. Uh, that's the Google uh, new application and, and artificial intelligence in health advice. And artificial intelligence will assist uh, or replace doctors, is better at performing some uh, simple surgery at the moment, uh, will be better at detecting um, many forms of chronic disease and cancer, heart attack, even just using your voice uh, to detect before anyone what's going on. So it's faster, it's less costly, and that, that will reduce uh, the problem of medical desert that we face in Italy, in France, and in many countries. And in, during COVID, many people didn't go to the hospital to get a checkup and died from cancer and other things because uh, they couldn't get telediagnosis. So that will also reduce the non-take-up of, of, of medical services. There are also risks. Uh, one of the risks is the big inequality in treatment. This number here, the green, is the investment of the US in uh, artificial intelligence. And Europe is uh, part of the rest of the world in a, a small uh, fraction of it. So there will be a lot of inequality between countries. And also within our countries, uh, as Florence said, there's the inequality in access to uh, uh, general practitioners, but there will be also inequality of access to this new technology, uh, unfortunately, and that's the role of the state to, to guarantee that it's not the case. There will be also psychosocial uh, uh, risk associated with new working. You, you've seen, well, I ordered a, a pizza on Deliveroo the other day and the guy never came and I probably got an accident on his bike and I felt very guilty. I thought never again I'm going to order uh, sushi or pizza uh, on Deliveroo or Uber delivery. Uh, and that's a drama. And, uh, that's one of the aspects. There are many aspects uh, beyond the risky environment. There's also isolation and new work on loneliness. People work only with machine or the remote workers. Or there are this new category of workers that are totally remote and long distance commuters for whom there are new risks as well. And if, I aid, if uh, uh, AI, if uh, artificial intelligence becomes the the manager, there's also a, a risk of increased stress, and stress is a killer, as we know, and uh, longer hours, a lot of strain put on, put on workers. Um, and finally, job insecurity with this uh, uh, increased uh, unemployment for all, let's say, even for white collar, uh, that has a strong impact. There's a lot of work um, on unemployment and mental health. Uh, now there's an increased fear of being replaced any time, and there'll be a lot of partial or irregular employment that also create a financial uncertainty. Uh, and you see the, in the graph the difference between the red, which is the unemployed people, and the blue, the employed people, is, uh, is quite huge in terms of uh, if you feel worthless, if you feel unhappy, uh, and if also uh, in terms of, of health, uh, direct health consequences, the unemployed are really um, at, in a very bad um, position. So policies of the future, that's very tentative. We don't know much about the development. It's hard to quantify the job loss or job uh, destruction and the job creation. Uh, but if there is unemployment, even for the some of the white collar, like tax expert or a radiologist, then there'll be more acceptability maybe for a, a system of universal income that could in fact be some kind of automatized minimum income or automatized safety net with interconnection of our system, information system and a direct communication between firms 
and uh, the government or, or, and the ministries uh, in charge of paying these this, this, uh, transfers. Uh, along that, uh, there's a, so there's a lot of work by uh, another uh, Nobel Prize, Esther Duflo. It's more for poor countries, but it's also true for rich countries, that giving people some guarantee of a minimum uh, cash uh, transfer is reducing financial insecurity and help them to be more uh, motivated and more uh, better in their life and be more uh, entrepreneur, more uh, better investor in themselves or in small firms, etc. Um, along that, a minimum universal health care would be, of course, appropriate, even though it's difficult to say, you know, are the poor going to spend this or everyone is going to spend enough money on their health. Um, if you, you can take a, a little paternalistic stance and say, we're not sure, so let's at least guarantee uh, a minimum coverage uh, along, along uh, a cash transfer. Um, I'm almost done. So another policy is to reduce working time. Um, if it's true that people can telework, can work remotely, uh, then what they do when they go to the office is to meet the colleagues and, you know, brainstorm and uh, collectively find solutions and so on. And that can be done by uh, computers or not yet. Uh, but what they used to do at home was to then finish a report, crunch some data, and this is typically what can be done with the assistance of an artificial intelligence. So that day at work, at, at home, the day where they don't take the car and don't pollute the planet, is something that actually, that, that type of, of tasks that they were doing during that day is something that can be done by um, artificial intelligence and that they might become free to take care of the family or themselves and be in better health. Uh, it's not clear yet that this uh, extra time, if you have one day a week out of work and properly out of work and not working, would be healthier. Uh, the French uh, evidence of the 35-hour uh, uh, work week uh, that we had some years ago didn't show clear uh, positive uh, conclusion about uh, the fact that people had more time uh, used, uh, that the extra time was used in, the, in a healthy way, doing more sport and, and so on. There are big, also legal challenge uh, to make people trust IA uh, to secure, you know, uh, or, or to make sure that personal data are not used badly, uh, to make sure that uh, these uh, uh, data are of good quality, and uh, to incorporate uh, this uh, uh, new technology in public services. I was talking about the risk of huge inequality across country, but also within countries, and that's going to be the role of the states to, to provide the safeguard also in terms of inequality to, to of, of access to, to these new uh, public services. Uh, the last um, aspect, and Ludovico mentioned the fact that mental health is a huge aspect of, uh, of health in general, and uh, to incorporate mental health as an objective, which is currently not the case, uh, is a big challenge, especially given all the new mental health issues related to lost jobs and uh, remote work, etc. And to treat, uh, and I'm quoting the WHO report there, to, to, to integrate mental health into primary care is, uh, is, a, is a huge need and a big challenge. To also adapt social labor and labor laws at the national level, but also at the European level. We talk about a, a social Europe. We are very far from it. It's basically just just recommendation and to think in an advanced future about uh, uh, some kind of universal or mini some part of un the universal system that would be at the European level with transferable rights, it would be uh, the sign of an advanced uh, collective society at the, at the EU level. Uh, we are very far from it, but we can still have some dreams. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Um, so now we open the floor for a Q&A. So um, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead. So yeah, in the meantime, I'd like to just uh, pick up in the last presentation and um, uh, ask you about so the smart working. Uh, so uh, uh, how how much do we see really nowadays on smart working? Our firms, uh, say in uh, European countries, in Italy or in France, are really engaging into that. So 
so that's the the first uh, point because uh, of course then also not all the jobs not all the tasks can be done uh, with smart working of course the uh, say administrative and service type of uh, uh, work could be easily done if you get more uh, manual work they cannot uh, and also I was thinking more in terms of uh, intergenerational type of uh, implications. Uh, um, might uh, the smart working uh, be good in a sense of, for instance, um, having uh, the possibility of, um, say, the mother who is working, who is doing smart working, to then work from home and so taking care of the child given the, you know, uh, I wouldn't say ab absence, but uh, uh, relatively a, a scarcity of uh, uh, childcare provision. So in that sense, that might be uh, something welcome, for, um, especially for the case of Italy, where uh, childcare provision is uh, still uh, not that well spread. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? I'll take the, the first half of the question and maybe leave uh, the, the second half to Ludivico and, and the colleagues. Um, so uh, there's an, a new observatory in Italy that actually uh, quantify uh, the, uh, um, um, the change in uh, work office, offices, like uh, housing for, for, for firms, and uh, the investment or the complete change, or at least from partial to complete change of the infrastructure and, and offices, uh, concern 51% of firms. So it's a huge number, and we see all the explosion of the housing bubble that is related to also the, 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 the massive decrease in, in, in needs for offices. So it's, it's, it is a reality. It was not a fashion thing during COVID uh, to say, okay, I work from home. It is, it is a, a, a big thing, and uh, some other agencies have tried to quantify how much of the work is teleworkable. And uh, I, I have the graph somewhere, we can look at that later, but uh, it's around at least 40% uh, in Italy, so uh, we are in the same order of magnitude. So we are roughly at half of the job for the moment is teleworkable and has impact on offices, so it's, it's quite huge. I'll just say one word on, a couple of words on the intergenerational effect. I, I think you're right, Maria, I think that having more help uh, more technologies could reduce some of the uh, unintended intergenerational effects that we that we see and the lack of uh, uh, of public support but the problem is that access to technology uh, um, access to technologies and in general the type of of works are not distributed randomly of course in population and it's probably like the case that the people in worse situation in society have less less access to new technologies and are in jobs that are in, let's say, are, are uh, less keen to give them this flexibility. So there is a huge debate to be held with firms as well. So th there's, a, there's a, an issue of culture uh, alongside, I would say, the, the, throughout the economy. Uh, to make this kind of things uh, reaching the people who need it, not the people who are already well off. No? So that would be my first reaction. I don't know whether you want to add yeah. something. To access to healthcare because teleworking plus teleconsultation could be a mix. You are at home, you have a few minutes, and you can call your doctor to have a visio. So, what of sells that? Francois was a wonderful laboratory during the COVID pandemic because initially there was no, no teleconsultation at all. What we observed during the COVID, we use that only educated people. Unhealthy people as well, so who we needed really to have an appointment and a new, uh, a new prescription. But many educated people, also people with grandchild, not child, because you know, your grandchild show you how to use the phone and so on to, 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 to talk to the doctor. But what we observe is that after the pandemic, there is no teleconsultation at all. So it was not a real habit that people uh, take, really. And uh, one more time, we observe that during the pandemic, mainly people who were out, who were working still in their office, continue to have access to health care. So even if there is some possibility of teleconsultation, in fact, people do not use that in order to go to the doctor. It is the reverse. When they are outside, when we go to work, the benefit from the fact to be outside 
and to have an appointment. Yeah, that's, that's really true. Um, yes, we have one question there. Uh, Mike? Uh, thank you all for presentation. Um, I have a question about um, the uh, lo longer uh, age expectancy uh, of uh, people. So some uh, scientists believe that the life expectancy will uh, extend uh, tremendously, like over 100 years, 120 years uh, s in, in two decades or, or so. Uh, how would that affect the uh, retirement age and the health of the working people uh, that uh, are supporting uh, more uh, old people uh, in general? Who wants to pick up this? Okay. I think um, that's a good question. I have no idea. Um, I mean, I, I think obviously, you know, Increasing retirement ages in step with changes in life expectancy, especially healthy life expectancy, obviously can help to address this. And if people are 120 and still doing productive things, then you know I think it's, it's I think you have to look at it through the lens of 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 how capable are people to keep doing everyday activities. And obviously there's an inequalities component because we know that there are people who, even if most of us are living to 120 in a few decades, which I can't imagine, but sounds great. Um, there will still be people who, you know, working construction, working, working jobs that are physically taxing that will, that, will, that will benefit maybe from some of this longevity gain, but will still, you know, need to, they'll still leave the labor market early. So I think we need very flexible approaches that account for the fact that people have different circumstances. But generally speaking, I mean, I think the key, is really, if people are still healthy, then age does not really matter, right? And we sort of can adjust things accordingly. Uh, yeah, but I was going to say that what you observe is that with the increase in life expectancy, there is also what we call the rectangularization, the square of survival growth, which means that there is more people that reach very, very old ages. So it's not as a continuity between um, so, so we know that we have a lot, a lot of very old people, and among them, some are very well, some other are not well at home. We know that uh, continue to work uh, are consequences, good consequences, on uh, cognitive uh, skills for some people, people that are white collar mainly. Uh, but we know that in the same time, as you had shown, uh, increase in retirement age and so on is not so well for poorly educated people and people with very demanding job. Um, hi. So um, I just have a question. Um, do you think that, for example, um, Cardiovascular diseases are a lead problem, for example, in health today in modern world. And do you think that maybe generalized programs um, would improve health of elderly people and that would probably prolong their um, health and uh, work capability? Um, for example, telemedicine was proven um, like useful in COVID, which was like generalized program for epidemics. And do you think that something like that can also be helpful in other generalized diseases like cardiovascular diseases or diabetes or something else? First of all, during many years, increase in life expectancy increase in us was mainly due to lifestyle and living condition and working condition. but since 20 years, something like that, except due, thanks to antibiotics and some uh, vaccine. But my, during many years, medicine was not so effective in order to, to treat people. But since 20 years, we have incredible treatment against cancer, again, uh, treatment or surgery techniques. And, and today, thanks to medicine, we have real ability to, to make people 
healthier. Uh, regarding telemedicine, it's one option, but it depends. For example, in France, we, are, we have done some experiment about uh, telemedicine in uh, part of France with very low density of doctors and treatments, and there is no result at all. Uh, but it is in France. In some countries, it seems that it is an issue, especially for instance in Italy, if we think to the difference between the north and the south of Italy. The density of doctors, of hospitals, is completely different. When I showed the unmet needs according to distance and waiting list, it was according to income, but in fact it is mainly in Italy according to location, if we live in the north of Italy or in the south. So, perhaps for diagnosis and so on, uh, for radiology, for instance, it's something which is quite good because it's possible to, to ask a colleagues to, to see and to interpret uh, the result. But uh, in cardiovascular, it's possible, and program, preventive programs are effective, yes. So if I can add something on that, uh, like when we talk about uh, um, basically non-communicable diseases, that uh, uh, happens mostly, of course, uh, in old age, and uh, well, they are a big problem for high-income countries, uh, but they're even more now for developing countries. Uh, so if you consider um, uh, this is like a, not only cardiovascular, but say uh, CPOD, uh, like a, a, a chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, that's uh, becoming a huge and huge problem. It's one of the uh, first causes of mortality. And uh, of course, it's very much connected to something else that we're observing, which is climate change and pollution, which is more of uh, a pressure, pressing issue in uh, um, polluted uh, towns, uh, growing towns in developing countries. So in terms of global health policies uh, becoming bigger in terms of discussion, uh, I think our policymakers need also to uh, type of, um, uh, engage in this type of discussion and, and find solutions for that. Um, so 11.16, I think we, we are, uh, took uh, all our time. Um, let me thank uh, all the speakers and the organizers and uh, you, of course. Uh, it was a, a great opportunity uh, to share this, uh, this um, uh, research-based knowledge to, uh, with you, and we hope uh, you enjoyed that. So have a good day. And if you have more questions, you can come to us uh, after the session, of course. We are happy to discuss. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>